There we are, try again. Hi everyone and welcome, I'm Petrina from the APDT and tonight I'm joined by Linda Ryan. Hi Linda. Are you still I'm muted sorry. or you're not? No, you're not. I'm now unmuted, it, make, it works better that way. Hello everybody. <laughs> Um, just to make sure everyone can see and hear and we're going live fine just give us a little reaction a little heart a little thumbs up just to let you know that just to let us know that you're watching if anyone can do that that would be great um so Linda why don't you tell people a little bit about yourself yeah thank you I'm really pleased to be here thank you very much to APTD for having me and it's a real it's a privilege to be part of dog training train your dog month um so yeah I'm I'm Linda I live and work in the new forest and I have my own um animal behavior and training consultancy called inspiring pet teaching and I teach clients I teach animals I work with vets and veterinary nurses supporting practices um and I'm a registered veterinary nurse. I'm a veterinary technician specialist in um, both behavior and oncology. And that's why I'm here. It's kind of the mesh of those two things, the behavior and the medical side of things led me down this path. Um, and I'm also a certified trainer, of course, member of the APTD. And I'm a certificated clinical animal behaviorist and I work with cats and dogs. I love cats, I love dogs. I can't choose between them. It's great to work with both. <laughs> so that's yeah. me in a nutshell. Perfect. No cats and dogs at war. Um, <laughs> no are you a cat person? Are you a dog person? I think I like to think I'm both. They both have merits and they both have different yeah. personalities. Um, so Linda's going to pre be presenting to us uh, all about cooperative care, which I'm sure lots of you know about already. But um, she's got some fab slides to show us. If you've got any questions, just pop them in the chat and we'll bring you them on screen. If you've got any comments about uh, Linda's presentation, anything you like, just pop them in the comments and, and we'll bring you up after. I'm going to hand over to you, Linda. Got a great presentation Lovely. to share. Thank you so much. And I'm so grateful to you, Petrina, as well, because I know you've been here every day this month. You're doing an incredible job and your energy and your passion for this is extraordinary. And just thank you masses personally to you yeah. as well as to APTD. So thank you. Um, so my plan today is to show you just a few slides, have a little chat about what cooperative care behaviors are and what we're talking about when we talk about this kind of training. So just give you some general information. Um, I am a cat person as well as a dog person. So we're not just going to see dogs, but everything that we talk about is gonna to apply to everybody. The concepts are transferable. And then my aim is to kind of hone in on one particular type of training so that we can just see it all in action and figure out how do I apply this in one context? So we'll look at one specific thing, which tonight is going to be tooth cleaning. Um, and then hopefully leave some time at the end for questions or chat or comments. Everything's welcome towards the end. I know that we potentially have a mixed audience. I don't know if we're all owners or trainers or who or what. So hopefully this will apply to everybody and somebody will get something from it. So here we go. Let me just do my slides, talk amongst yourselves for a moment while I figure that out. Here we go. So I'm just gonna pop those up. Katrina, if you could let me know, can you see the screen? Yeah, that's all working fine. Great, okay. So as mentioned, I have a foot in both the camps of veterinary and also in training and behavior. And I love it when those two things come together. And I think they have to come together. I think for too many years, we've had these siloed concepts of training and behavior and veterinary, two separate things. But actually we need to consider mental and physical health together with equal weight. Um, and that's really, really important. Neither is more important than the other. And so for me, this all comes together in terms of how we prepare our patients for veterinary visits, looking at the training side of things and what we can do. So I'm gonna talk about consent-based behavior and the tooth cleaning training, as I said, but for me training, I am a trainer and I love training, but training has to work for the animal. It has to be meaningful for the individual. We don't need to teach things that we want animals to do. We need to teach them things that are gonna benefit them, that are gonna improve their quality of life, that are gonna make life easier and help them feel safer within our care. Um, so when I first started as a trainer, it was all me and my clicker and look what I can make this animal do and aren't I smart? Um, nowadays, at the ripe old age of almost 50 next month, I'm like, it's not about me, it's about the animals. So how can we use training to make their lives better? So that's where consent-based training comes in. So let's start off by defining our terms. So cooperative care is being bandied about a lot now. It's a really popular concept, 
thank the Lord. It's a wonderful thing. I'm so happy we have it. Um, and when I was first learning about all of this stuff, I was talking on a webinar yesterday about how I discovered all of this years ago before this was a term when we were trying to work with the oncology patients that were coming in day in, day out for their treatment, often for months on end, having a miserable time because we don't get taught about behavior as veterinary professionals and we don't know very much. We're really good at the clinical stuff. And so I started exploring and learning, you know, how can we use positive reinforcement? How can we use enrichment? How can we use calm, gentle handling? Nowadays, it's got a term. It's called cooperative care training. And so what do we mean by this? So the aim really is to encourage and facilitate pets to become collaborative participants in their necessary care procedures. That's what we're aiming to do. And I would even go as far as to, we use the term cooperative care, but I actually prefer consent-based training. I prefer to use the word consent because cooperation almost has even that connotation of do it, do it because you have to cooperate. Um, so I would prefer to even move further away from that and call it consent based training, but cooperative care is all right. And this is what we're talking about when we talk about it. So what do we do? How do we do it? There's a lot to say, and I could literally talk to you for an entire day on this. So I'm going to kind of skim over the headlines and just the kind of general concepts of what cooperative care or consent based training is about. So we're thinking about using patient friendly or pet friendly, sorry, I always call them patients because I'm a vet nurse and a behaviorist, but pet friendly, animal friendly, environmental setup. So what does that mean? It means the animal needs to be physically and emotionally comfortable. So to give you an example of this, if we are trying to take um, a blood sample or clip a dog's nails and they're perched up on a slippery metal table, they're going to slip, they're going to struggle, they're not going to feel safe, they're not going to be physically stable, and then they're going to get labeled as being badly behaved and wriggly. We haven't set them up for success. So instead, we want to think about how we use our physical environment to set our animals up so that they feel safe and they don't need to do the wiggling and the squiggling. And we don't do the thing of going, oh, bad dog, you shouldn't have been wriggling, which of course they're not bad. They're scared or they're uncomfortable. So we think about how we can set the environment up for conducive, um, calm, relaxed, physical comfort, emotional comfort. And then we think about our interactions, us as humans, how we interact with patients, how we have consistent, predictable, positive interactions with the animals to make sure that we feel like a safe place. We also want to think about the sociality of that animal. So if it's a dog, we know that they're obligately social, as we, as we call them, they need social interaction, and they're very much bonded to humans. So it's very important how we interact with dogs when we're doing any kind of husbandry or handling or care procedures, because they will very often They'll let us get away with things because they're obligately social and we need to be careful that we're not falling into the trap of going good dog well done instead of actually taking it from their perspective and seeing what they need and how we can change how we interact with them so that their needs are met um we might want to think about i don't know so-called prey species like bunnies they are going to need a friend around they can't be separated or alpacas i've worked with my neighbors and alpacas across the road and you can't just segregate one out you've got to have a group um or if you're a cat you don't want anybody around it's just you so you've got to think about the social nature of that animal and how we socially interact and then of course positive reinforcement and this can be kind of what i call lazy training um, where we train all day we use every opportunity that presents itself to us we're not actively formally um, training we're not setting up a session where we're doing actual teaching but we're noticing things that we like and for husbandry and care procedures this is something that we can literally train all day and as my friend Laura Monaco Torelli always says, husbandry opportunities are all around us. And so we can use our daily interactions and daily um, stuff that we do with our animals to positively reinforce behaviors that we like that set us up for foundation skills. And we'll talk about what those foundation skills are in just a little bit. And of course, we can set up for active teaching where we discover, you know, how to teach tooth cleaning in this case, or um, as we're going to see shortly, a little video of my cat Olive learning to put her nose into an Taylor, take 10 breaths um, and be lovely and calm about it. So these are our sort of active skills that we teach. So there's lots of different ways and components to how we go about it. So what is consent? I've already said I prefer consent based training to cooperation. Um, consent is opting in. It's saying, yes, I'm in. I want to. Let's do it. Come on. Let's do it together. We're a team. So you can see my beauty here, my little girly. She's sitting on a block and this is her say yes block. Um, and so when she hops up on this, it's what we call a start button behavior. It cues me 
to begin the training session. And if she hops off it, that cues me to stop the training session. But I don't even need this, to be honest with her, because we're so um, we're aware of each other. I know her. She knows me. We trust each other. She just has to give me this face, this look, this yes, please. Um, so it's opting in. And so consent based training and interactions are all about choice and emotional comfort. We want the animal to be in control. And that's what this block is all about is saying when you're ready, you tell me, then we can begin. If you want to stop, you just tell me. Um, we want them to be emotionally comfortable. Of course, we want them to feel safe. We want the environment to be um, un undistracting. We don't want them to want or need for anything. We want them to feel like they're in a place where they're like, yeah, let's let's play. And we want them to choose to interact. And some of the choices that we might teach them to make would be to be calm during husbandry or care procedures or interactions in the veterinary clinic or the groomer. And often um, all we really want from an animal is to be lovely and chill. That's it. We don't need anything fancy schmancy from them. Um, or we might teach active behaviors like open your mouth and say, ah, depending on what it is that we want them to do. Um, ideally, we would think about all the things that might happen to a, a pet in a veterinary clinic or a groomer or that we might need to do to them throughout their lives, like drying their paws or brushing them or clipping their claws or whatever. And we would make a list of those. And from day one, um, we would think about training foundation skills for those and really thinking about pre-procedure planning so that the animal comes to the procedure with a skill set and they understand, ah, oh, okay, this is where I get to do my nose in a bucket or whatever it is we're, we're trying to get them to do. And then sometimes we can train on the fly. So what that means is if we have a behaviorally normal animal, so they don't have any anxieties or fears, all of their wants and needs are met, they're lovely and happy and they're relaxed and they're opting in and we don't have any concerns, they've got no negative associations with procedures, we could perhaps work with them to do something that we need to do. So for example, you've got some knots behind your ear, baby girl, I need to get those out or they're gonna get really nasty and they're gonna start pulling your hair. I should have been a better owner and noticed them before they got knotted, of course, but that's the way it is. So maybe this dog that I'm working with is comfortable being brushed, but has never been brushed behind the ears. So we work with brushing in a place where they're comfortable, stop, feed a treat. Another little bit of brushing where they're comfortable, stop, feed a treat gradually work towards the ear a bit, stopping often, feeding a treat, working towards the tip of the knot, a little bit of brushing, stop, feed a treat. Are they emotionally comfortable? Are they relaxed and, and happy? Yeah, keep on, little bit, feed a treat, little bit, feed a treat. So we're working on the fly to do something that we need to get done by pairing it with positives, building associations and ensuring emotional comfort at the same time. It goes both ways. So cooperative care is not all about teaching animals to do things, it's us us humans, we need to have human behavior change for the pets as well. We need to inconvenience ourselves. We need to learn. We need to take their perspective. And that's incredibly important. What it isn't is just getting things done. Short term pain for long term gain is for their own good. Let's just get it done. Because if we do that, we're not giving consent. It's not cooperative. And yes, there are times when that has to happen. And we can unpack this a little bit more when we chat later. Um, but that's not consent based. And so we always need to remember that if I dive in and I get that brush into the knot behind the ear of that dog that's never been brushed there and they're really upset about it, but haha, I got the mat out, cool. Learning is always happening. So these are neurons connecting. If we do it well and if we do it badly, learning is happening. And we want to think about what we're putting in the bank for the future. So just getting it done is going to put things in the bank, which are going to stack up problems for the animal and for us in the future. Whereas if we do it well, we're building lovely positive connections that are going to help us in the future. So what does consent look like? So some examples could be passive, but it's never passive because if the animal's opting in, it's always actually active. But what we mean by that is we might ask an animal to learn to be comfortable while they're being handled or having their bodies manipulated or um, being in a particular position. So we're asking for basically stillness, calm, relaxed acceptance and or duration for that behavior. So if I'm thinking of something like an ultrasound that might take 20 or 30 minutes, we need the animal to feel really comfortable lying on its side with um, something on its belly and a little bit of movement. And we want them to feel generally, um, genuinely relaxed with that. And then we've got active. And again, it's all active if you're opting in. But what we tend to think of as active is maybe a response to a cue. So I would like to clip your nails. Please, could you put your paw in my hand? Um, and if you take your paw out of my hand, I know that that means you need a break and I should stop. And so we might or um, we might ask an animal to, I don't know, put two paws up on a target so that we can examine their belly or something like that. So we're asking them to have perhaps 
offer a body part, move into a position, or we might use targeting to go to a particular place or follow something to get on and off a of scales in and out of a kennel so that we don't have to manipulate or manhandle, we can offer them choice. And so we're moving away from this kind of thing where no choice is being offered. We can see that this cat is having its inhaler. Um, we can see by the body language and the tension throughout this cat's body, the, the tight neck, the ears that are really you know, tight at the base, the scrunched up face, um, and the level of restraint that is being used here. I'm restraining from behind. I'm it's not me, by the way, I'm not doing this. This is a picture off the internet. Um, and the mask is being held very tightly on the face. There is zero consent there. Yes, we might be getting the procedure done, but are we going to get it done tomorrow or the next day or for the rest of this cat's life? Um, probably not. So we want to move away from this. And here's an example of consensual interaction. So this is my beautiful Olive, and she is learning to put her nose actively into the mask, put some pressure on it so that it moves the valve, breathe for eight or 10 breaths. This might be considered passive because she's just resting her face in there. And you can see she's super comfy and she's waiting for her click. See that little ear, ear twitch there? Yeah, mama, thank you very much. So this is active and passive behaviors, very consensual, no force, no coercion, a completely comfortable cat that's very relaxed. So these are some videos that we made a series of with International Cat Care, who I work closely with and I adore and they do wonderful work. So please go to their website and have a look for these videos. We made them in collaboration with Trudell Animal Health, who make the Aero Cat. So these are also made for horses and for dogs. So you can use these videos for cats, horses, dogs. They're also great for sharing with clients or if you're not very experienced in training because we've got lots of basic stuff in there, some skills, and then some lovely stuff on um, the concepts of how to break things down into little sections and then build, build them in layers within the animal's capability. So do go have a look at those on the International Cat Care site. So the training skills that we want to use are tacos. And again, I could talk all day about tacos and how to teach them, but basically we want to think about um, vegan tacos, of course, for January, Veganuary. Uh, this concept comes from Julie Shaw via Colleen Cock, who's a veterinary behaviorist. We want to think about the animal learning to target different body parts to different things, different types of targeting. We want to think about them giving us calm, relaxed, engaged attention. That doesn't mean they have to be eye contact machines, but we want them to opt in. Um, capturing, that's the human skill. We need to get really good at training, at capturing the behavior that we've decided to work on. Observation, another human skill. So we need to get really good at watching the animal's emotional state and watching for the behavior that we're training. And then stationing, that's an animal skill. So that might be sitting in a position, standing, lying down on a target, um, you know, doing something which is basically still and waiting for the next thing to happen. You could also make S shaping, which is a human skill, which is basically capturing where you turn a behavior into something different. You progress it through incremental um, changing of those behaviors by shaping it towards what you want it to be. So tacos encompasses human and animal skills, and we can have loads of different foundations there, which will help us with our husbandry and handling and care procedures for consent-based training. So here are some examples. So this is Evie stationing on her Say Yes platform. She is targeting her chin to my hand. We're training here for consensual jugular blood samples. And is she engaged? I think so, definitely. So we're fulfilling a lot of our um, TACOs criteria here. Here we have attention to handler, both of these two. These are my two beauties. So we can see Evie in her buster collar here going, woo, I finally have an eye infection. I get to wear this thing I've been training for for so long. Yeah, so she's right into that. Um, we can see Olive, my little beautiful. She is doing two things. She's both saying to me, mm -hmm, mom, come on, let's do it. She's attentive, she's into it, she's saying yes. But she's also stationing on her say yes mat, which is where we go for her to say, I'm ready to train. Then we have our human behavior change skills. So the bottom picture here, this is my little cousin. Um, she's very young here, uh, working with Priscilla. And she's learning about observation, capturing, respect for the animal, looking at what they can do and how we can work with them to teach them what's beneficial to them. In the bottom corner here, we have my beautiful Heidi. She's not mine, but I feel like she's mine. I've been working with her for six years now, and I just, I've just i been with her since her, her adoption from Battersea and her amazing, amazing, amazing mum. So mum here is learning to advocate for Heidi, to observe her emotional state and her behaviours, to add positive reinforcement. The veterinary professional here is learning to communicate with mum, so they're working really well together. They are, um, he is also watching body language and behaviour, and they're working in a yes, no, okay, you can proceed, no, stop, they're communicating to work. So we're communicating for the patient. 
Heidi is targeting and saying yes by being on this little platform. And we can see by her body language, she's beautifully relaxed. So these are just some examples of how our tacos work. And these are lovely skills that we can build in general. They don't have to be specific to husbandry or handling or cooperative care, but they're gonna be our baselines on which we build everything from. So I'm gonna focus on tooth cleaning and just pick, it, pick one specific thing that we can talk about so you can see how I would go about training this and how I would build it from nothing. So tooth cleaning, I think is really important. As a veterinary nurse, I can say that it's as important for us to clean our animals teeth as it is for us to look after our own teeth for lots of reasons. Um, one, it's yucky if you've got disgusting breath and manky teeth. It can cause pain if we have really revolting mouths. It can cause systemic infections and systemic problems throughout the body if it's really severe. It predisposes animals to need general anesthetics and dentistry procedures, which are painful, risky, and sometimes animals are having multiples of these in their lifetimes. So if we can look after their dental health, that's a wonderful thing that we can do. So much as I might like to just dive into those beautiful little fangs and get a, get a toothbrush on them, I want to actually begin somewhere that the animal can do. And so again, first we're gonna see a cat, then we're gonna see a dog. There will be dog training, I promise, for the dog training, um, train your dog month. So we start with what the animal can do. So I'm gonna show you a video of Ollie. Apologies if these are a bit staccato, by the way, my internet is slow. So what I'm starting with here is a rule structure. I touch your body, you're calm. I take my hand off you and I feed. So it's touch, 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 comfort, 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 stop and feed. And so she's learning that rule structure for being touched anywhere on her body any kind of touch, light touches, firmer touches, little bit of pressure, a little bit less pressure. I'm not going anywhere near her teeth right now or even her head or neck. I'm just creating that ability to say, if I pinch you, if I poke you, if I touch you there, little tiny mouth touch, cause I can see she's comfy, release and treat. She's on her say yes podium. She's sitting on her little bathroom chair. We always train in the bathroom. And so if she gets off that, I know that she doesn't want to do it anymore. And I very regularly throw a piece of food off that so that she has a choice to jump back up and engage again. So touch and sometimes longer, sometimes less, sometimes more, sometimes higher, sometimes lower. And we really want to train for generalization. So once an animal is really comfortable with all sorts of interactions and handling, then they're ready to get a little bit more specific. So I think this general stuff is really helpful because oftentimes when we go into the veterinary clinic or when we go to the groomer, there's a lot of stuff that we can't necessarily predict or control. Whereas if our animals are really comfortable with, I can be touched for a short time, a long time. I can be touched in that place or this place. I can be touched hard, touched light. It can be hot, it can be cold. It can be sharp, it can be blunt. It can be soft, it can be you know, tickly. Um, anywhere on my body, that's a wonderful skill set that we can build. And then we can move more towards the specifics. So we start where the animal is, we meet them where they are, and then we progress, in this case, to mouth handling. So I've got these videos on Facebook, but Petrina and I actually discovered it was better if I download them and play them from the PowerPoint. So you can go and look at them on Facebook as well. So this is my beauty, my little Evie. And here we can now start getting a bit more specific. We're moving in towards head touches. So again, she's on her say yes platform. I'm using the chin rest for a say yes proceed, uh, behavior. And I'm starting to just get her really comfortable with touching, releasing, feeding. And I am actually using a marker as well. I'm using a, a yes, I think here. So while my hand is on her, yes, release and feed. So touch. Lift the lip a little bit. Yes, release and feed. And the reason she's so sharp at jumping away is because she's waiting for her yes. So I've got better at that. And look at this, this isn't dental handling. What am I doing? I'm playing a game with a ball. Yes, because cooperative care training is fun. We just wanna make it part of an animal's fun training routine. We just play. So we might do some cooperative care training. Then we might do some silly things like doing a twist on your block or chasing your holy roller. And then we go back to mouth handling again. It's all just bits of this, bits of that. You love it, we love it, it's fun. And again, if it feels fun, we're gonna be much more likely to do the training for everybody, for the humans and the dogs. So there, there was a little bit of, oh, it's a bit hard. So I made it a slower repetition there. I didn't go too far. We saw that little tiny lip lick and then a longer one next time. So we're starting to build that comfort with having her muzzle handled, having her lip being raised, having my finger just a tiny bit inside her mouth because that's going to feel a little bit different. All of these sensations will be new. All the while, how's she doing? Is she okay? Body language? I think she's fine. She looks very engaged. 
We've got a slow wavy tail. She's neither overly aroused nor bored or fed up. She's definitely not worried. She's really happy. And all the while I'm not training, she's like, come on, let's do more. And so we're again, every time I'm waiting for her to look back at me, I want her to re-engage. And then we're ready to do a little more. I'm gonna to touch you around the back of your teeth now. And then I'm gonna introduce the actual toothbrush. And you might wanna break it down a lot more depending on how confident your animal is, how they're doing. We don't have to rush from one thing to the next thing to the next thing. We might spend weeks practicing one stage and then move on depending on your individual. This little girl has worked on tons of husbandry and handling and consent-based training for this kind of thing. So she's very good at getting the concepts. So again, here we go. We're gonna mix it up with some silly stuff because she loves all that. And we're just making her consent-based training part of the fun. And she's loving it. Yep, so again, wait for her to be ready. And that was just a little chin rest, but I'm not gonna touch you just so that it's not always predictable I'm doing this. It's sometimes we just do chin rest for no reason. That's a longer hold. So again, we're mixing it between longer, shorter, and each time I release and feed so that every single handling interaction predicts something that she wants. So there I'm pausing and I'm waiting for that tiny moment where she goes, you can carry on. And that was an ear movement there. So the brushing is gonna feel really weird. So we take that really slow. And here I'm just practicing a little bit of something different in your mouth. So I've just got a syringe. I believe I've actually got a little bit of cold water to simulate having something put into her mouth. So if I'm going to move on to, for example, toothbrushing, having something on the toothbrush is gonna to feel different as well. So again, what I'm aiming to do there is generalize oral handling skills. So being touched on your muzzle, having your lip lifted, having my finger in your mouth, having my finger on your tooth, having my finger rubbing around on your tooth, having a different object in your mouth, having the brush sensation on your mouth, having the sensation of something being put into your mouth like cold water or warm water. We're generalizing, we're mixing up the skills so that it's really easy for her. She's got a database. And then no matter where your animal is, no matter how we build the increments, we progress at their pace and we move with what they are ready for. There's no rush. So this is where we get to. Um, so now we have a fully trained behavior and here we can see she puts her chin in my hand to say yes. You can probably see from the way my hand is holding her nose there, it's such light pressure. All I'm doing is just stabilizing her and actually I'm, I'm stabilizing me more because I feel like I need to have a hand there in order to brush. She probably doesn't even need that, but there's no restraint. There is no fear, there's no force. Sometimes I just hold her muzzle without brushing. Sometimes I hold her muzzle, we do a little bit more, a little bit less. So we're doing real life tooth cleaning here. So we've done the canine, click, treat. Now we're gonna do a little bit more. We're gonna gently insert, do some molars, click, treat. And what you'll see I'm doing here, which is much better than the initial steps when I was clicking while my hand was on her and she was ricocheting off to get her treat. I am now doing brush, 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 brush. Stop, release, and then click so that I'm getting that beautiful hold after I finished and I'm not getting that whiplash neck moving away. So the click is now coming after I finished while she's still in position and she's lovely and calm. And again, I always want to be watching the emotional state of the animal, making sure that they're genuinely opting in, genuinely consenting and really comfortable. And it's a fun thing for them to do. So we can progress that at their own, at their own pace. So that's what it's all about. That's a little example of it. Really a conversation starter and opening it up so that um, people can kind of start thinking about where can I go with this? And um, I'm very happy to, to take questions. So what we're looking for, our overarching goals are voluntary participation, long-term compliance. And when I'm talking about compliance, I'm not using it in the old school veterinary way of I want the client to comply. Um, what we're saying here is if it's fun, if it's easy, if both the animal and the human are enjoying themselves, we're gonna to get tooth cleaning for the animal's whole life. It's not gonna just be on oh, the vets that I had to do it after I had my dental or whatever. It's gonna be a fun thing that we build into our routine with all of our other fun things that we teach. And then we have an animal who is comfortable and engaged and going, oh yay, it's tooth cleaning time, rather than, oh my God, there's my toothbrush. 
So that's all I've got for you in terms of the presentation. I hope that was interesting and I hope that was useful. I'm really happy to chat more, to answer questions and to dive into any detail that people want to talk about. Um, this is me, this is where you can find me. So my website is inspiringpets.com. These are all the educational institutions that I am really proud to work with and collaborate with on, on, on various different projects. Um, and then you can also find me on Facebook at Inspiring Pets and Insta as well. If you're interested, you can meet me there. And I think that's probably enough from me. So I'm going to stop the presentation and find a way to get back to Petrina. <laughs> there we are. Find, okay. find me in your tabs. Great. Yeah. That was brilliant. I really, really enjoyed that. And I've actually got questions to ask you myself, but I'm going to <laughs> open it up to the crowd first and just have um, have some comments from them. Um, Zoe Carter has been watching and she says, how do we really know consent rather than desensitization and the animal really wants to engage with their caregivers? That's a really great question. And um, I presented yesterday to a group of trainers and we talked about the difference between, you know, training and retroactive behavior work. And so if I've got an animal, I like to think of them as starting from zero. So you've got a behaviorally healthy animal who is never had a negative experience, never had a problem. They don't have any other behavior problems or health concerns. We have no, no worries about that. That would be an animal that we are working on classical conditioning and habituation with. So we're starting from zero and we're working towards positives. We want plus signs and we wanna put money in our bank because we've got an empty piggy bank to start with and then we want to fill it up. So that would be our classical conditioning and our desensitization, sorry, our habituation. And that's a lot of the stuff that us as trainers are working with proactively um, day to day. And then some of us will be working on animals who are minus something. They might be minus 10 or minus 20, depending on what their history is. And that will really depend on their learning history. So those animals that have perhaps had negative experiences with interactions or handling or husbandry or care procedures, or maybe they have other behavior problems, for example, anxiety disorders, or they might have health conditions. We might want to think a little bit more deeply about how we approach that. So is that within our capability as trainers? Are we comfortable going down that road? Are we, are we happy? In which case then we would be working on counter conditioning and desensitization. We would want to take things incredibly slowly. Um, so I'm not sure Zoe, if you're a trainer or a, um, a, a, an owner or what your role is, but um, counter conditioning is where we are changing the animal's emotional state so if it's a worried dog, we're moving from worry to zero to happiness. Um, whereas uh, classical conditioning is zero to happiness. I don't know what this thing is, but it's a toothbrush and it seems to be wonderful. Whereas the dog who's worried about their toothbrush might be like, oh my God, I've met toothbrushes before. They're really horrible. And then we want to get to zero with that animal before we can start moving forward. Um, so in those cases, we might be doing counter conditioning and desensitization. If it's really severe or we feel like we don't have the knowledge or the skills or the ability to do that, we might want to involve a behaviorist to help as well. And oftentimes they can devise a behavior plan and then the trainer can do the actual work with them. So it really depends on the animal, on their learning history. But if we're concerned in any way, we don't want to go about just making an animal get used to something. I wish we could take those words out of the English language when it comes to animal training. We'd never want to make an animal get used to something um, because what we're doing is inadvertently um, flooding them and we might sensitize them to the procedure and make things a lot worse. So always assess your animal from the beginning. Are they neutral? Are they a zero and we're, we're adding plus signs or are they a minus sign that we need to get to zero first and then we consider what the animal needs and no matter who, no matter what, we're breaking it down into tiny weeny little increments and working at that animal's pace. So I hope that answers your question. I don't know, Petrina, anything else you want to add to that? Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, you're, you, you, I mean, of course you explained it brilliantly. I'm not going to explain it any better than you, but you always think of desensitization and counter conditioning. There's already an existing problem. Whereas if you're if there's no existing problem and you just want to build positive associations, then you're doing classical uh, classical and habituation aren't you so yeah yeah, yeah. Great. um uh sarah's just got and uh, zoe just said thank you and what yeah, what dog have you got Hello, zoe <laughs> what dog have you got in that picture what do you reckon is this like guess the breed because i'm like it might be a bit wheatony but i might is it a lakeland it, yeah, or is maybe. it a it's hard to tell my teeny screen very maybe cute anyway gonna <laughs> um and Sarah's got a little question. Um, when I'm working with puppy owners, they are working on overall handling, consent and a chin rest. What one additional skill would you recommend that I teach them? Bearing in mind, they may not carry on learning new skills 
after they finish their course working with me. I love that. Hello, Sarah. It's lovely to see you here. <laughs> um, yeah, I love teaching husbandry and handling skills to babies. And I never sell it as that because I think in many cases, whilst it is catching on, I think if we sell it as husbandry handling, you know, cooperative care classes, we're not going to sell half as many as if we're teaching it puppy life skills or tricks. So I tend to teach them as tricks. And then I'm like, oh, that could work as a cooperative care behavior because you've learned to put your foot on this target or you've learned to put your nose in this cup or all of those fun, silly things that you get buy-in with tricks. So teach tricks by all means, um, things that can double, feed two birds with one seed. Don't tell the caregiver what you're doing. And then after they've learned it and they've had a lovely time, you go, oh, we could use that in the vets. Um, so that's a fun trick and a fun tip that I use. But the other thing that I think, if we could only teach one thing, it would be anti-vet vaccination. And by that, I do not mean to vet bash. I adore my profession. I absolutely love my vets. Um, but what they do is they they spring surprises on us that we are, we've are we trained for all the things that we think are possibly possible that might happen to the, the animal in the clinic. And then the vet comes along without doing anything wrong or anything bad, and they do it in a different way. And the animal's sitting there going, whoa, I never prepared for this, what? And they're all concerned and surprised and upset about it. So what do I mean by anti-vet vaccination? Or it could be anti-groomer vaccination. It could be, you know, make up your own, whoever. Is I like surprises. That's it. Generalization. Mm -hmm. That's it. So what we were talking about there at the beginning where we showed the video of Olive um, is just being touched, having body parts moved, things which are unexpected, things which happen to you by surprise, um, hard touches, soft touches, pinches, pokes, um, hot, cold, sharp, blunt. Um, oh, I'm going to just come in and crank your mouth open whether you're ready for it or not. And I'm not saying we should do that and make animals get used to it. But if we can teach them that sometimes people do weird things to your body, it's all fine. It might not be what you're used to, but you have a database of safety or a database of knowledge that helps you cope when weird things happen. Does that make sense? So for me, if I could only teach one thing, that's what I would do. I wouldn't even bother with anything specific, but of course, settle on a mat is a great thing too. Um, but it's it's the anti, anti-interaction anti vaccination, if that makes sense, <laughs> that preventative. Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, totally agree. And I remember I, I really enjoyed that. I like surprises bit of the Lincoln Life mm. Skills course from many yeah. years ago. Um, yeah, Sarah said, uh, great i will start adding in surprises from tomorrow um you were right about the wheaton terrier katrina i know yeah so <laughs> because I, I used to look after a lovely wheaton terrier called lottie who's bonkers um anyway sarah, um, sarah and i go way back i met sarah uh, years and years ago at edinburgh vet school when i was working in the oncology department and she brought her beautiful border collie screwball to us and uh, and later we meet in the training world again which is really cool <laughs> Oh, um, yeah. and she said, uh, def I think that was going back to your uh, tricks comment. Definitely agree with that. I teach a chin rest for fun when we talk about how we can use it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Don't even mention the vet at that point. <laughs> that yeah. comes later. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how many, all right, how long is a piece of string? How many sessions would you think it would take somebody from a dog that hasn't really got a problem with it? that we know of, but you've never tried to do it. Mm. Would you think, do you think they could get it done within about a month of training? I think it really, really depends on the animal, mm. doesn't it? And it also depends on the skill. So when I think about um, Olive and that inhaler training, she's not asthmatic, she didn't need an inhaler. <laughs> and she's a little six year old cat that came from a rescue center with no training history whatsoever. But she is, I always talk about my two animals as glass half empty, glass half full. So Evie, my little dog, very much glass half empty. Everything is a problem until proven otherwise. Olive is glass half full. So she goes through the world going, ooh, whereas Evie goes through the world going, uh-oh. Um, and so when you've got a glass half full kind of animal like Olive, her, she's temperamentally predisposed to feel comfortable with, you know, she's like, what's this? Instead of going, oh, sugar lumps. Um, when I was asked to do this project, they were like, how long do you think it'll take? And I was like, I don't know. It's training a cat to stick their face in a, in a mask and hold it there for 10 breaths. It could take years. I don't know. Um, it took us four months. And mm. I think a huge amount of it is not about how long it takes. It's about how we break the skill down. So I really, really encourage people, rather than being goal-focused, as I need those videos by X deadline, so we've got to get it done, 
instead say it'll be done when it's done um, but let's really enjoy the process of learning to put your nose in a thing learning to do a behavior with duration they're all tacos they're all skill sets that we can start teaching that will really benefit that animal so rather than thinking about the finished behavior i like to think about enjoying the journey i know it's a cliche but enjoy the journey make that the fun bit and if you get there when you get there you're going to be like yeah we did it but actually it's become less important because what you're doing when you're doing these cooperative care behaviors is you're building so much trust with your animal, you're putting so much money in the bank, and you'll often find many of them multitask. Um, so many of the things that we're teaching are meeting many goals and many ends. So I don't know, how long did it teach me to take me to teach Evie to have her tooth, teeth brushed? Probably three days, because she understands the concept of mm. husbandry and handling training. She trusts me, we have lots of rule structures, and she was like, well, this is weird, but it's just another weird thing we're learning, so never mind. Whereas if we had a dog who'd never experienced any kind of cooperative care training, it could have taken weeks or months. So really mm. it's about the individual and it's about focusing on the journey and enjoying that journey. And then when you get to your goal, it's almost gonna be disappointing because you're gonna not be doing that training anymore, but then you can start a different project. <laughs> mm. So disappointing answer because it did not give you an X equals blah, but that's how it is. <laughs> Um, do you have a preference as to what toothbrushes you use? Because I've seen, you know, we've got our like traditional toothbrushes, which are quite like ours. And I've seen these electric dog toothbrushes. These There's one by a mate called Emmy Pet. I don't know if they're any different to any of the others. Have you tried any of the electric ones? I haven't tried the electric ones, um, but mm. I can imagine you would need to work extremely hard on your journey um, mm. because many dogs are going to find that somewhat aversive. And I think we're going to have to be really, really, really careful in how we break that down. So desens or counter conditioning, desensitizing if there's a problem in the beginning, but habituating and classically conditioning to the noise, to vibration on all parts of your body, to vibration and sound near your head. There's going to be so much work involved in that. And if you've got a glass half empty kind of animal, Animal, you may never get there um mm. this is why i have not tried these on evie because i don't think it's you know it's just not worth it um whereas ollie i might be like yeah she can do this so i tend to in terms of preference for toothbrushes whatever works for that individual we've got a cupboard full we've got one of those v-shaped ones that's supposed to go on the front and the back of the tooth mm -hmm. um I've never found those particularly useful. I think they're damned awkward, to be honest. What we know from the recent literature is actually, if we're brushing the outsides of the teeth, we're probably doing a really good job. Brushing the insides is probably less relevant because the, the plaque seems to build up on the outsides. Mm. So for me, I prefer a single-sided brush. Um, I would usually choose a soft one. It doesn't have to be a very, very hard one. And make sure it's appropriate to the animal's mouth size. So we don't want to be using a gigantic human toothbrush on a rabbit or a cat. Um, but on a big dog, we could probably use that. Um, so the one that I was using for Evie has two sides. There's a bigger side and a smaller side. So I would use the smaller side for the cat, the bigger side for the dog. Um, you can also get these nice little finger brushes that just fit onto the end of your finger and they've just got some um, bristles and a little bit of kind of texture there so that you can just, and they can be nice for training so that you can start training. You can even just use a piece of micro fleece on your finger to get the training started to build that sensation. You don't necessarily even have to go in there with a brush to begin with. So just a little piece of swab or a, a tissue or a piece of cloth. Um, really what it's about is abrasion. It's about getting rid of those plaque and tartar buildups before they begin, just daily trying to get those teeth clean so as to prevent that buildup and that and, and it getting under the gum and causing gingivitis, which is painful. And again, mm. the outside aspects of the teeth are probably the most important. So go with what works and what's comfortable for the animal and comfortable for you to handle. Mm. Um, and what I find, even, even me, even working as hard as I do, I find I'm really, really good at cleaning this side of her mouth and she's really, really comfortable. When I swap hands and I go for the other side, there's always a lot more fidgeting. And I know that that's because of my skills. I need to build my skills. I need to be better because I'm using the wrong hand and I'm being a bit cat candid about it. So, yeah. <laughs> I don't know when, why I just thought of, you know, when you try and paint, I'm right-handed, you try and paint your left hand. It's never very mm. good, is it? <laughs> it's, it's all up your cuticles, it's everywhere. <laughs> Um, and like, does it matter what brand of toothpaste you use as long as it's kind of palatable for the dog? 
Exactly. I don't actually use toothbrush because again, okay. or toothpaste, should I say, because again, it's about abrasion. Okay. Um, and so some vets will recommend that you use enzymatic products. Um, mm -hmm. Speaking to our board certified veterinary dentists that I've worked with over many years, they would much rather that we had the abrasion. If you can mm -hmm. get the enzymatic toothpaste in there as well, super. Sometimes I find it's anti-helping. Um, so of course it has to be a pet safe toothpaste. You can't just dive in there with your Colgate. It's got to be pet safe. Um, but sometimes it's, they make it so palatable and delicious that the animal spends the whole time being like nom 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 and licking and chewing and it can actually be really difficult i mean that you don't get your teeth cleaned so you're not getting the abrasion so you're missing the big piece which is what you should be doing because the animal's having a lovely time sucking a lollipop um so mm -hmm. again go with your veterinary recommendation but sometimes actually just abrasion is what you need and you don't necessarily need to get the toothpaste involved but chat to your vet great that that's great Do you know i've I've never heard anybody actually say that. Um, and it does make perfect sense because as soon as you get in there with the brush, they're like, oh, no, 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 I quite like this. Nom, and then you have nom. to <laughs> stop while you're kind of, and they're just chewing the brush. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, then, and then you don't get any good tooth cleaning done. And then, of course, from a training perspective, we're building that into our skill, which is the opposite of what we want. And so the more often it happens, the more often it gets reinforced, the more often it gets repeated. And all of a sudden we've broken our beautiful tooth cleaning skill. So yeah, I, I tend to not use toothpaste at all. I might give her some afterwards. Like once I finish brushing, I might just put some on my finger and swish it around for the enzyme effect. But I don't know whether there's sense in that or not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. Perfect. And of course, I suppose if your dog's already got bad teeth and you're wanting to start cleaning their teeth, they can speak to their vet, can't they, about yeah. getting the teeth professionally cleaned first. Absolutely. Because um, yeah. so if they've never... About yeah yeah we're talking about healthy animals neutral animals behaviorally and health wise um you know proactive but of course one of the times that your vet is going to ask you to clean your animal's teeth is after they've done a dental procedure so mm. if you have any concerns about your animal's teeth or gum health um you know really again this kind of training can be really good at helping you to be good at monitoring their dental health monitoring what's normal for them so that you can actually lift the lip and have a look and see is there any redness um and all that kind of stuff. So if you have any concerns, the first place, or if you're thinking of starting tooth cleaning and you've got maybe a middle-aged or older animal, if you're unsure, the first thing to do is go and talk to your vet, have a chat with them. Is it okay for me to start cleaning teeth or do we need anything else to happen first? And then sometimes if they've had a, a, um, a veterinary dentistry procedure, then that's when we want to wait for them to heal and not be sore anymore. And then we start the procedure, we get that going afterwards. So yeah, definitely. Great, wonderful, Linda, that's been... Yeah, I've learned. I love the tacos thing. Um, that's great. I did a sneaky little uh, screen print because I was watching love the it. Facebook Live and I was like, tacos, I haven't heard that one before, but I really like it. Um, really so fun. if you didn't, if you missed that bit, guys, go back and watch that bit. Do a sneaky little screen print and it, it gives a credit to who I invented it as well. It um, and for me, it's all about making it accessible, fun, easy, because if it's fun and easy, people will do it and animals will enjoy it and then it will happen more. So, cool. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think also you're, um, I'm not, I can't think what you called it. You, I know you said it was about your cat's podium. I can't remember what you called it for your dog's platform. Yeah. But that it's whole... just, they call it her say yes platform or her say yes, yeah, her say yes box, mm. whichever, you know, platform. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's so important to use that skill for so many different things. Does the dog want to engage and do this stuff with us? Or have they wandered off and gone to do something else? And if they've wandered off to do something else, that says they're not engaged and they're not saying yes. Like you said, Absolutely. So. There's our information. And then we would want to ask ourselves why. Is the environment right for them? Are we interacting with them in a consistent, predictable, positive way? Are they well? Do they need something? Have they got water? Have they got options to go and find what they want? Do they need to pee? Is it cold? Is it hot? Are they distracted? Is the postman here? Uh, you know, if they're not engaging, we don't want to blame the animal. We want to ask ourselves, um, why is this? And is this an appropriate time for training? Because again, the life doesn't revolve around training. Training is something we add to life to make life better for our animals. And, you know, we want to make sure that they have the opportunity to go be a dog, be a cat, you know, rather than make them engage if they don't want to. So yeah, I think that's really important. And, you know, again, gosh, you've probably got the impression I can talk about this all day. I have so much more to say about this. I did a I did a workshop in um, Rhodes with Sarah Ellis on this for cats. We took three hours and we were we still ran out of time. And I did one in Las Vegas this year, and I, I had half a day, and I still ran out of time. So there's so much to say, and there's so much to talk about. But hopefully, this has given some people some ideas, inspired a little bit, and um, hopefully been useful for some people. 
Mm, perfect. Well, um, anything else you want to add before I let everyone know what's going on tomorrow? No, time for supper is what I want to add. Yeah, Have a nice supper, time. everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much, Linda. So um, tomorrow we've got APDT member Erica Peachy. Some of you may have read Erica's books from back in the day. And I did say that to her when I first spoke to her. I said, I know your name. I think I read some of your books. And she said, oh, yeah, I've written. I've, I've, I think I've read your book. And she said, I've written quite a few, which made me laugh. Um, so lady with lots and lots and lots of years of experience. Um, she's coming on tomorrow to talk to us at six o'clock about training games. So tune in then. Watch That'll way. be wonderful. Yay. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you to those of you who've been with us and uh, have a lovely evening, everybody. Thanks, guys.